The Invocation by Rev. By Pastor Bill Miller Zarell, Holy Trinity Lutheran Church. Mm -hmm. Bill Gerard. Mm -hmm. Let us pray. Creator and sustainer God, we give you thanks for giving us life and a planet that continually works by your grace to sustain us day by day. Make us mindful of how dependent we are on your abiding presence as we see the work of your hand through nature. Remind us to seek to be obedient to your charge to care for what you've given us and to share the abundance of your providential hand so no one will be without food to eat or protective shelter or a livelihood in which they can be co-creators with you of a better community. Grant those here tonight in positions of responsibility and attitude of godly stewardship of this community as they make decisions that affect the life of all persons under their jurisdiction. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is in your name we pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, we are very honored tonight to have with us representatives of Kenworth Neighborhood, who Martha Espy and Tessie Dillingham, who are going to make a presentation of a quilt. And I believe we have three representatives. Do we have three? Kelly. Kelly Walker. Kelly Walker. Kelly Walker, okay. She's the president. In March 2012, the following letter went out from all to all members of the Kenworth Neighborhood Association. Dear friends and neighbors, the nature of this letter is to inform you of some exciting news from the Kenworth Neighborhood. This spring, we will begin to assemble a Kenworth neighborhood theme quilt. The quilt would represent the diversity that has come to make Kenworth such a unique and special neighborhood. The quilt will be made up of many different and personal swatches of cloth from our neighbors. We are urging you, your participation in this great community effort. This will be a great opportunity to get to know our neighbors on a more personal level. We are looking for people who can help do the quilting or folks who will donate a special swatch of fabric for, and we will in, incorporate into the design of the quilt. You can even join us for fellowship if you like. In addition, we hope to have this project up and running in time for the Zara Baker Playground in mid-April. It should be noticed that the swatches of any size, but it would be helpful if they are close to eight by 10 inches square. Um, I'm Martha Espy, a part of the uh, committee. Jeanette Killian is not here tonight, I don't think. And Kelly Walker is on that committee. We had a few meetings and we got the swatches, but the project was slow to get off the ground. We did get the swatches cut, but not much else was done. Timing may have played a factor. In October, my niece, who is a professional quilter from Tennessee, was visiting, and she could see that the possibilities in our effort. She pinned together a sample and displayed it at our neighborhood meeting in October. Everyone liked it, but it was only pinned together. In January, a church member was visiting me and, and was telling me, and I was telling her her struggle. And she said she knew of someone who might be able to help. Not sure, but give her a call. She came, yes, and she put it together. At this point, I knew that we would have a hard time 
having it hand quilted. Did she know someone who would machine quilt it for us? Marianne to the rescue again. She took three members of our neighborhood to a quilter in Alexander County, and we learned that she would do it for free if we didn't need it right away. Finally in July, Mary Ann called me again to say that she had the quilt and it was beautiful, but it needed a binding. She then said, I am not a member of your neighborhood, but I like what you are trying to do and I would like to be a part of it. May I put the binding on? <laughs> Guess what my answer to her was? <laughs> the quilt has had a journey. All the swatches came from Kenworth, the design from Tennessee, the quilting from Alexander County, and the finishing touches from Northwest Hickory. I would like to show it to you now. Well, turn it around turn that it way. Yeah. Let's have a big hand for that, okay? Unfortunately, we were not able to use all the swatches, so you know where you can find some. <laughs> and also, um, uh, what was the other thing? The, um, the police, police badges could not be put on it because the quilter could not do that, so they will add those later. Uh, what's next for our quilt? It will be on display at our neighborhood block party in September at the Zara Baker Playground. And after that, it will probably be auctioned off. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion to up. Mr. Lale and Mr. Meisner are enjoying vacations with their children and grandchildren. Mr. Lale with his children, no grandchildren. Do <laughs> we have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. So moved. You, the persons can be heard. Oh, excuse me. I, I don't know how many times I've done that. First, we have persons requesting to be heard. And we have three people who've requested to be heard, starting with Jim Starkey. Good evening, Mayor Wright and uh, Council Members. I'm Jim Starkey. I was the originating chairman of the <coughs> Homeless Veterans Stand Down Program, which we started in 2011. We had stand downs in 2012 and 13. At both of the stand downs, we uh, helped over approximately 200 homeless and needy veterans. Uh, we also, both years, we saw 57 homeless people who had dental problems, extensive dental problems. Uh, some of the, this past year, some of the dentists that were that devoted their time and efforts to it extracted up to 11 and 12 teeth from some people. They, their teeth were so bad. The, also, with the Veterans Helping Veterans, I'm one of the uh, founding members of that group. We have, since that time, about three years ago, we have brought out of the woods, so to speak, out of tents, put about seven people into apartments. These were homeless people. They're in apartments now. They're functioning. Also, we have put about 15 people into education classes at the, uh, through uh, CBC, uh, CBCC technical courses. Uh, they, some of them are in school now, some are waiting for the uh, next class to start. We have about 12 or 13 people that we have taken to different meetings, we have presentations we have done, and we have gotten them jobs. They are now productive members of society, living in homes and stuff like this rather than in the tents. This 
system has been supported by Grace House. We have offices there, we do our meetings there, we do counseling there for the homeless and the needy veterans. Uh, I think it's very important to the community that the Grace House continues functioning as it is. There may be a few small things that need to be changed around with it, but as far as the Grace House function with the homeless, especially with the homeless veterans, it has been a really a blessing to us. And uh, so I like, just like to have that information out, knowing some of the things that the Grace House does. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I understand the applause, but I have to ask you, let's not repeat that because we have a we have a position here that we don't have cheering and jeering. That was not cheering or jeering necessarily, but uh, we have to we pretty much have to enforce that or we're gonna end up with in some cases with groups trying to outdo each other. And that's all we want to avoid. Uh, but I agree with you, Jim Stark is one of the biggest hearted guys I've ever seen. So I was tempted to applaud, but I'm glad I didn't because we're not supposed to. <laughs> Roger Cornett. I'm honored to be here, Mayor and Council. Uh, I don't have a prepared speech. I'm doing it off the cuff, so to speak, tonight. I just found out about this yesterday. Um, my name is Roger Cornett. I'm director of Open Door Homeless Relief Program. We are a 501c nonprofit. We work through a Baptist church off Springs Road. I have an office there. And we're unique in our ministry in that we, we're the only ministry that goes out to the camps. And I'm the only person that does that. Now, I have taken uh, my American Legion liaison, uh, who is here tonight, and will be speaking shortly too, and some of the other folks in here out to camps. I've taken business groups, um, the poverty tour last year, if you remember this, that came through Hickory in the bus from Raleigh including uh, the esteemed Professor Nichols, who's Director of Poverty for the state of North Carolina. And he was kind enough to come out during this uh, recent storm we had this past winter and uh, went to the camps with me, spent the day. And we went through snow, ice, everything. Had to put it in four-wheel drive to get to some of these areas. We do have a, a homeless problem in this county, and a lot of people don't like to recognize it. But that's my job, to try to do these presentations speak at groups, things of that nature, to let them know what's really going on. And if you should like me to present at some future time, or even tonight, I have posters, 20 by 30 posters, of camps five minutes away from here. Recent pictures done by a photojournalist. Uh, we've been honored in the Charlotte Observer. They did a five-month investigation into our program when they heard what we were doing, going out to the camps. A lot of people are afraid to do this. and. Uh, I just don't have a natural fear for that. I, I love these people, and I found out that they're just like us. Uh, and what I like to tell most people, and I'm not going to be wordy in this speech, is we've got 30% of these people just down and out luck, bad luck. 30% mental issues. These are the tough ones, the mental health issues there. And we have people in here that deal with it. We have a lot of people that deal with that type of thing. And I love these people. And I love our homeless friends that have these mental issues too, but I'm, I'm lost in, in really dealing with it what's going on with some of them. And then the other 30% are addiction issues, as you well know. And you hear a lot about those. And, uh, they're more standout. You know, we have law enforcement issues. And I have an officer here tonight. I'm, I'm honored that he comes out to our program. And everybody loves him. The homes people have really grown attached to him. He's, he's been a, a real asset to our program. We operate every two weeks at the Grace House. So I'd like to plug the Grace House to you and say that they do a wonderful job there. And they allowed us to come in. They invited us over. They have an open area where the limousines used to be parked, as all, you, all of you well know. It used to be the funeral home. And we operate there. We bring snacks out. We have fellowship with them. I helped to do the point in time count for the United Way. So I'm plugged into all these organizations. I do it quietly and in, in the background. If anybody should need some information on what's going on in the homeless community, I'd be glad to address it, either people in the audience, uh, media, or city council at any time in the future. I just ask you to please reach out with love in your heart because we're trying to bring, first of all, comfort to these people. Three minutes. Okay, comfort, uh, uh, 
housing in the form of tents. That's all we can offer at this point. There's nothing else. And love and bring God back into their lives. Thank you very much. Thank you. Julie Walker, The Cognitive Connection. Hello, and, and uh, thank you for the opportunity for allowing me to speak. Um, I am Julie Walker. I am the program director for the Cognitive Connection, and um, within our treatment facility, we actually run uh, outpatient treatment uh, for people that have addiction issues. We run a full array of outpatient treatment for substance abuse, everything from assessment to regular outpatient intensive. We also have state and federal contracts to where we have money available to clients that don't uh, have insurance type programs um, and, and we're partnered with uh, managed care organizations. We also are partnered with the other providers within the managed care organizations like Catawba Valley Behavioral Health Care, Family Net, Department of Social Services. We've actually been in operation for around 18 years and uh, we've actually grown quite extensively with our service array but one of our uh, standing uh, philosophies within what we do as an agency in business is that we can't do everything under our umbrella of services even for those that have the addiction issues. We truly have to collaborate in reference to securing appropriate resources for clients in need. And so that's always been our philosophy and so we do have strong partnerships in reference to helping guide uh, consumers within our county that actually suffer from addiction and mental health issue because there's actually a high population of people within communities that have what they call co-occurring disorders and they need treatment between mental health and substance abuse. Um, another area of our agency is uh, we also run employment programs, employment and training programs. And we've been doing this actually since back in 2007, 2008 and it's through federal funds, Workforce Investment Act, we're heavily attached to the job links. But through our employment and training services, basically what we've seen, and it has to do with the economic factor and some of the changes our nation has went through, is that you know, homelessness is now an e epidemic within our nation, and you can see it here in Catawba County. It's quite evident. But one thing that I'm proud of in reference to Catawba County is that we are very resource guided, and we tend to pull together and do collaborate to figure out how can we work with varied populations in need. One thing that was missing in reference to serving homelessness, and a lot of them do have have some addiction as well as mental health. Some of them again are just in a, in a situation where they've lost their income and just have not been able to secure the right path in order to sustain you know, a true lifestyle that they so desire. But all of that's need element. So basically Grace House has actually offered one of the barriers that had been missing is a day program to where uh, providers can come together, resources can come together, and provide services. We currently have a full-time clinician over there that works with them through peer support and counseling. We also transport them to and from treatment programs. We are partnered with the other affiliates there at Grace House. So I'm here just to encourage stronger partnerships through Grace House and also to applaud Grace House for getting this up and running and I'm just um, actually encouraging us to continue the sustainability of this program. Homelessness is here and you know it's it's better for us to work together to actually uh, work with these individuals and it's easier to do that if they are in a, in a location to where we can work with them instead of them being scattered out between the county and it's hard for them to access service. But again, thank you. And again, uh, we are really promoting Grace House and the sustainability efforts with that program. Thank you. Thank you. 
Jeffrey, you want to say something? No. Okay. Uh, well, appreciate those comments. Uh, some of you may be wondering why, and, I, and I'm sort of wondering why we had these comments tonight, although they were very informative and timely, I'm sure. Uh, but there's no question that tremendous service has been provided to a lot of deserving people, and uh, there have been a lot of success stories. At the same time, we have heard, and we have to deal with this too, issues concerning people who uh, are, are not behaving the way that you all would like them to behave uh, in our downtown area. And so, uh, uh, I don't know, I don't think any plans have been made, but I think it would be good for us to sit down with uh, Pastor Jack and Jim and Cognitive Connection and uh, the other folks and, and talk about what we can do to help make this thing work better for everybody. And I think that's what these comments were about. I appreciate the respectful comments. I appreciate the, uh, the uh, you know, last week we had, we had uh, kind of a spectacle here. I just want everyone here to know who was here last week that we are not going to tolerate that from now until the election. We don't take that on when we become public servants. It will not be abided here. Someone else someday may tolerate that, but it won't be abided here until after this election, I can assure you. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mr. Uh, McConnell is actually on the agenda under persons requesting to be heard. He had submitted. Pastor Jack, he had I'm, submitted. I'm sorry. He had submitted on Friday to the clerk, so he's actually on the I'm agenda. <laughs> Everybody told my story, so I... <laughs> it was nice I got to sit back and hear all that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to briefly um, address the issue, and I was going to do a little history about Grace House, but we don't have a lot of time. But Grace House came about because of a need we saw in the community. There was a tremendous gap in our services in the community, and that was that there was nothing for people to do in the daytime. Say so they were getting in trouble down on the square and other places because they had no place to go. Coldest of temperatures, the worst heat in the summer, they were standing on the street corners. And so that's how Grace House came about. Um, we recently moved to the uh, old Hickory Funeral Home because it was a bigger facility because we had more services we could offer. So we needed a larger facility. Uh, and we offer, I gave you all a, a sheet there, a little brochure on what we do. There are a tremendous amount of things that we're doing now. Right now our newest program is the SOAR program, which helps people uh, obtain their disability. Uh, many people have been eligible to meet criteria for disability for years, was not able to do that, didn't know how, didn't have the resources, and so we were able to help them do that. It's been a tremendous success. We get people with their disability in about four months, which is faster than any other uh, services can provide any other agency. And we are very connected with the other services. One of the things that happens at Grace House, a lot of people don't know, they say, what, what happens there? Well, we get people connected with other services. Our motto is that we don't expect you to, uh, to live to change before you come to Grace House. Uh, we're going to love you as, you as you make changes. And so we try to bring people in without a lot of expectations try to help them uh, make changes uh, once they learn to trust and, and know that we are there to care for them. Um, and so we do want to meet with uh, city officials and with some of the neighbors that uh, we share in the neighborhood so that people will have a better understanding of what we do, that we're not just, people don't just hang out there and smoke cigarettes and drink stale sodas, you know, uh, that there is a purpose and a reason for why they're there and things are happening. A lot of success stories we could tell you about people getting in, moving from home, homelessness into apartments, going to halfway houses. Uh, we've probably gotten in the last couple of years 22 people into uh, inpatient uh, substance abuse treatment. Um, I know of 63, at least 63 people we got connected with mental health services. Lots of good things happening and so we do want to work with our neighbors and, and the people downtown to see what we can do to work together as a team. Uh, I believe that the, the way things happen, successful things, is, is through teamwork and through uh, our community action. So we, we are part of the community. We want to work with the community. Uh, we, just like everyone else, want the best for, for the city of Hickory. 
and uh, so we we thought it was time for us to come and speak to the, the council and the mayor and and to explain what really you know what really happens there and that that it's not just hanging out but things really happen there um, so we have a lot of things, uh, a lot of services that we people don't know about. The, we help people get their ID. We help them with medications. People say, well, they have a, a shelter they can go to at night, but uh, and certainly not criticizing Salvation Army. They're a wonderful group. Uh, but they, uh, if you, not everyone's able to go there. And so I've got to stop. But, but just if you look at those brochures, you'll get a better understanding of all the things and activities that happen there. And I would like, would like for us to set up a meeting so we can all talk. Thank you, sir. We will do that. Thank you, sir. Now, motion to approve the minutes. Second. <clears throat> motion by Mrs. Fox, second by Mrs. Patton. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, no. That is unanimous. Any items to be moved from the consent agenda? Reaffirmation. Reaffirmation. We've got to put some <laughs> to be bold hurry. type on this. <laughs> uh, we have a motion to reaffirm and ratify on second reading. Second. 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 Motion by Mr. Seaver, second by Mrs. Patton. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, no. That's carried. Any items to be removed from the consent agenda? Move approval of consent agenda. Second. Motion by Mr. Guest, second by Mr. Seaver. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Motion's carried. Public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Our first public hearing and only public hearing this evening is to consider a rezoning petition uh, property located at 28th Street Southeast. And I'll ask uh, Mr. Cal Overby, the city's principal planner, to come to the podium and present that item to council prior to the public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mayor Wright, Council Members, Ms. Crum. This night before you is rezoning petition 13-10. This petition has been submitted by Mr. Charles Dixon, his agent for the Roseman Family LLC. Uh, this particular rezoning uh, is comprised of six parcels totaling about 3.2, 3.32 acres located on 20 Street Southeast in uh, Hickory. Uh, to give you some bearings of where we're at here, this is CR Lane Furniture, uh, CVCC here, uh, Benco Steel, and this would be uh, Lowe's Home Improvement, Tower Valley Community College, uh, Highway 70 here, Sweetwater Road area here. The request is to rezone the property currently from its current zoning of R3 residential to C3 regional commercial. As you can see, the southernmost property, approximately half of it is currently zoned uh, C3 regional commercial, while approximately half of it is on R3 residential, as well as the remainder of these lots that are outlined uh, in the bold area, which are hatched, or the actual properties uh, under consideration in this area. As you can see, with respect to the, the existing zoning around it, uh, Pretty much uh, all the zoning around this, this particular area is on uh, regional commercial, except for uh, this area, which is a, uh, a residential neighborhood. Well, it uh, has a number of houses in it, as well as some uh, properties in this area which uh, are vacant and a fire station. And a fast forward one more slide, and this basically shows our future land use plan, which was contained within our Hicker by Choice uh, uh, comprehensive plan. As you can see, the entire area uh, is basically a regional commercial. Staff has uh, reviewed this in light of the requirements that are contained within our development code and our plans for uh, for consistency with our general plan and as far as the rezoning concerned and found that they do meet this, these general standards. Our planning commission held a public hearing with respect to consideration of this rezoning petition on June 26. At that hearing, uh, the representatives for the Rosen Family LLC spoke in favor of the petition. No one spoke in opposition of the petition. At the conclusion of the hearing, the Planning Commission uh, deemed the request to be consistent with our future land use plan and recommended that this petition be approved by Hickory City Council. And with that, I will close and answer any questions the council may have at this point in time. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Overby. Uh, we will have a public hearing to discuss this issue. And uh, during this public hearing, we allow uh, first the people who would like to speak against the proposal to address the council. 
and then people who'd like to speak for it, and then we allow rebuttals. Rebuttal five minute periods. The initial uh, time allocation we ask is 15 minutes to be divided as the, as the speakers see fit, but we ask you to consider the 15 minute uh, limit. With that, I'll declare the public hearing open and call on first the two people who signed up to speak against this proposal. First uh, on the list is Roger Cornett. Okay, uh, City Council and Mayor, I think there's some confusion, I think, in the audience out here about this particular rezoning. We were looking at the rezoning issues involving the Grace House in downtown. So is that going to be addressed at this meeting tonight? No. No, okay, there's no for some reason that's uh, there's been some confusion in the community and I think there's a lot of people in here right now that thought there was, was going to be a rezoning requ uh, request for the Grace House property and the property downtown. I'm so be I don't know how this came about or what happened. But, Sometimes uh, I'm the last one to know but I haven't heard anything whatsoever about this. Okay, then I think that uh, clears up some of the confusion we have in the audience. Then. We have a lot, of, a lot of people involved with homelessness and some of the organizations such as mine and the people that are involved deeply with Pastor Jack and and uh, mental health, homelessness, everything. Everything's tied in together. And we were all under the impression that this was a rezoning issue for the Grace House property. So the, undoubtedly something, somehow something's leaked out wrong somewhere. It's funny we want to apologize works. for that. It's funny but, how that works sometimes. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, and we appreciate though you listening to what we had to say about that and we'd like to uh, address the council again at some future time with presentations and we'll keep it again we won't be wordy about it we'll keep it short and sweet but we have a lot of fine people in here that I've met in the last three years since I've been doing this and my organization is real quiet as I said earlier and low-key but these people are are the movers and shakers in the homelessness issue some of them you've heard tonight some of you haven't so I would appreciate uh, you know some focus in the future on this issue and we apologize for the miscommunications whatever happened Thank you for your comments, your brevity, and your good spirit. Levi Helton, were you confused too? <laughs> join, the, join the club. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I was under the same impression that Roger was, uh, but I apologize. But I do have something I'd like to present to, the, to you and the council. It's a petition to keep Grace House open. It's uh, 149 signatures. Most of them come from the American Legion. If I could, who do I present this to? Thank you, sir. I would like to uh, read you a little comment about what you pledge when you pledge the allegiance. For well, I figure some of you don't even know what the words mean. Well, let's do this. I'm going to, I'm going to, how do I just, uh, well, I, a recess from the public here. Well, I, I think that the best thing to do is to <clears throat> ask him to stand down for a moment, finish the public hearing, and after that, make a motion to hear something that's not on the agenda. Because he, he, Mr. Helton had signed up, so let, let, if that's okay, let's finish the public hearing. Okay. Uh, and uh, then we'll go from there. Okay, so you want me to wait? We're going to ask you to sit down right there next okay. to Mr. Overby, if you don't mind. And this thank, thank you. Okay, thank, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, now, I'm going to declare the public hearing open and call on those who would like to speak against this proposal. Is there anyone who would like to speak for this proposal? We have Mr. Charles Dixon signed up to speak. I am uh, Charlie Dixon. I appear for the Roseman uh, Family Partnership of supporting the rezoning. First, I'd like to say I'm so grateful that all of these people here are not here opposing what I've got to say. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Al, if you'll move, make the uh, slides go when I uh, ask you to do so, I'd appreciate it, okay? Um, let me first say that uh, my client is the Roseman Family Partnership, and the property that's involved here is owned by them. The company is C.R. Roseman Upholstering Company that is also owned by the Roseman uh, family. 
but the property that we're talking about is to be uh, is the Roseman Family Partnership. Now let me tell you just briefly about the Roseman uh, Upholstery Company. It was formed in 1958 in Brookford. It moved to this site in 1960, so it's been there, uh, I believe, uh, 53 years. And it's on the north side of Highway 70. It's just east of 28th Street Southeast. Uh, the reason that uh, this matter is involved here is that they are trying to expand their business. And uh, they have are in the process of adding uh, 42,000 square feet of, of uh, manufacturing space. It's 21,000 feet on two floors. Uh, they hope after that is complete they'll have a more efficient operation, but also that they'll be able to add 15 uh, to 20 uh, new employees. Uh, move, move the next slide, if you will. Uh, I wanted to show that uh, you can see the the small things, uh, small pieces to the left side of 28th Street. Uh, most of that is owned by the family partnership. The northernmost piece is owned by residents, uh, Mr. Yang. To the east, uh, that's in the brown, is zoned uh, R3. And to the south of that is where the, uh, the factory is located, just south of 20. Uh, uh, 17th Avenue and east of 28th Street. Now let me uh, also explain to you what will happen after the rezoning. The purpose of the rezoning is the property on the west side of 28th Street is to make it possible to extend the employee parking. The use of the factory site, however, is not going to be changed except to extend it to the east. And when the trucks uh, come into the factory in the future. Most of them will come in off of uh, se Highway 70 and they'll actually enter on the east side of the property. Uh, they have gotten a building permit, building permit to add the factory, but they also got a highway permit to permit an entry and exit on the east side of the property. So the trucks actually will come into the plant and leave the plant down on Highway uh, 70 will not go through the neighborhood, will not affect the neighborhood. Uh, if, however, a truck did need to come home from the west side, they wouldn't go down 27th Avenue, which is only partially open. It is not open all the way to the back of the factory. It actually would enter the property on the property site itself. It's fenced in, I believe, on the factory site, and the trucks would come off 28th Street if they came in from the west, turn to the east, and be entirely on the, uh, the plant site. It would not be in the neighborhood. Now, some of the property owners that we were able to contact are Mr. Yang, who does occupy the northernmost property, and he was in favor of the rezoning. Uh, uh, Bill Burton and his company owns all the property to the west of the property that's to be rezoned, and he's in favor of the rezoning. And the third person we were able to contact is Jerry Twiggs, who is representative of, of a company called Third, uh, Third Gate, and it's the darker brown to the north side, and uh, he has a, his company has a permit to build a large, uh, uh, a large uh, residential development. And he also was in favor of the rezoning. So uh, we uh, tried to contact uh, some of the uh, neighbors who were not able to do so. A lot of the houses, though, that are there are actually owned by the Roseman Family Partnership. But with the uh, way the plan is for the use of the property and the way the uh, minimum uh, impingement on the area by additional traffic uh, I don't think uh, this use is going to in any way depreciate the neighborhood and uh, we argued and suggest and ask that you approve the rezoning which was approved unanimously by the planning board and there was no opposition to the uh, change in the rezoning at the planning board meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you Mr. Dixon. Is there anyone who wishes to offer a rebuttal? 
I declare the public hearing closed and ask for motion or discussion. So moved. Second. Second. Motion by Mrs. Fox, second by Mr. Guess. All in favor, please say aye. 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 It's unanimous. Flood recovery update. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to call initially on uh, Ms. Karen Yowsey, who's the Emergency Management Coordinator for Catawba County, and ask her to present information that uh, is relevant to our citizens about how those who have received damage on their private property, uh, the processes that are in place for them to uh, seek support. And then after Ms. Yowsey's presentation, if you all have questions of her specific to that and being sensitive to her time, uh, we'll, we'll let her go if that's okay, and then we'll turn it over to Chuck Hanson, who'll go into more of the public infrastructure issues that uh, the city's dealing with. Ms. Yowsey. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, council members, Mr. Berry. Um, I really wish that there was not a reason for me to be here talking you, to you tonight about what's happened to our community. Um, but unfortunately, on Saturday, July 27th, we had an extensive rainfall across the county that severely affected Hickory and some of the surrounding communities to Hickory. Um, and some of the staff here in Hickory asked me if I'd give a little overview and tell you about what the citizens here in Hickory can expect in the days going forward and the kinds of things that we're putting in place right now. Um, just to give you a little perspective on where we are, the upper left-hand picture is the morning of Saturday, July 27th. Um, that's Catawba County. The kind of deep purple kind of color there in the middle represents somewhere between 10 and 15 inches of rain that started about 5.30 in the morning and ended at about 11 o'clock in the morning. That came on top of the right-hand lower picture there. That is from January to now. And you see that exact same area is 20 inches over normal for this time of year. Um, so it's set up for kind of the perfect storm on Saturday morning, already incredibly saturated soil and very heavy rainfall. Just a few pictures to, to kind of go through for you. And I started with this one because there was a point at about 8.30 or 9 in the morning when we had more than 12 active swift water rescues going on in Catawba County at the same time, some of which were here in Hickory. And the real heroes of that day are the Hickory Fire Department and the Hickory Police Department and the efforts they made to protect the citizens as this was unfolding. <coughs> This is some of the, one of the swift water teams that was in place that day to try and rescue some people. What you don't see in this picture is a road, a bridge, and three homes that are just off of that mailbox that you see to the right because they're all underwater. This was about 7.30 or 8 in the morning on Saturday. Where is that? Um, that is actually between um, the southeast corner of Hickory and, um, and the mall, the Newton Conover, kind of where Hickory and Newton Conover all come together. Um, but that's just typical of a lot of, the, a lot of the places across the county. And again, some more pictures uh, showing bridges and roads underwater, parking lots inundated, folks trying to drive through this water um, that unfortunately should not have been, which is what necessitated the swift water rescues. Uh, that had to go on that morning. Uh, as of this morning at 8 o'clock in the morning, we had 840 homes registered as having had property damage. We have been able to assess 713 of those. Um, as of last evening, we had an assessment teams out again today. We have four destroyed um, properties. 84 with major damage, and major damage means they had more than 18 or 24 inches, depending on the type of structure it was, inside a living area. In other words, in your living room or in your bedroom. Um, we have 465 with minor damage. They may very well have had six or eight inches inside, depending on the type of structure that it was. And 161 other. And by other, I don't want to demean them at all. We, during the assessment, did not find house damage, but we did find extensive property damage. Their driveway is gone. Uh, the culvert over that their driveway goes over is gone. The bridge that their driveway goes over is gone. 
um, retaining walls at the back of their property have completely collapsed. So the others also have extensive damage. It's just not defined by the residential house damage um, that the first three sets of numbers are defined by. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is my favorite picture of all because you can't, you can't look at seven, 800 homes damaged and think, well, you know, is that significant until you look at the numbers of them on the, on the map there. And if we laid that uh, precipitation graph back over that, you would see exactly that's where that purplish pink blob was on the morning of July 27th. Some examples of some of the, the damage that people residentially are dealing with. This actually is a culvert that collapsed. You can see somebody's driveway coming in there. Um, there are a number of homes that are still cut off from being able to use their vehicles or come and go comfortably or easily from their homes because their driveway or private road has been cut off. This is a retaining wall at the back of somebody's property that has collapsed. This is actually um, not too far from here in Hickory. Trees that in the saturated soil just fell over, um, crashing on the back of somebody's property onto their house. Water damage. Um, Henry in the picture there is about six feet tall, so you can do the rest of the calculations there and see how high the water was at this particular home. And again, um, more substantiation of the amount of water that was in people's homes. Some of these houses we have found not because people reported their damage, but because in driving by we saw their belongings strung out on the front lawn as they were trying to drive things out. And our assessment teams have stopped and said, you know, hey, can we talk to you about your, about your situation? There are some homeowners that have been blessed enough to be able to start taking out wallboard and taking up flooring and working on drying the um, inner structures of the walls. The wallboard really should not be put up until those have been dried for a couple of weeks. Um, otherwise, you're just setting them up for additional mold um, if it's not appropriately dried. Those are commercial um, dehumidifiers sitting there that are drying this house. So what we've done so far as a county um, in coordination with the municipalities that are affected, on Monday, July 29th, the first thing we did was send an official request to the state of North Carolina for a damage assessment of residential properties. In other words, that's the first step for getting individual assistance um, for homeowners, uh, for residents that are affected by the disaster on a personal or family level. We sent that to North Carolina Emergency Management. They sent the two teams um, a few days later. Those teams toured across Catawba County, looked at all the damage, um, but they were focused on the residential damage. And um, the results of that evaluation showed that we met the minimum criteria for a small business administration um, declaration, which is a federal uh, assistance program that comes along in partnership with some state assistance. Um, on August 1st, we got the notification that we met that threshold, which we immediately turned back around and asked the governor to add on um, to that request one for type one individual assistance, um, which is in the, the governor's purview to grant to Catawba County and the municipalities. Um, that comes after a small business administration loan. So if you don't get a small business administration, declaration, you don't get a type 1 declaration. But the type 1 is a second declaration. Um, it provides temporary housing. It provides money to citizens to replace belongings, um, such as bedding, clothing, um, furniture. It helps them replace vehicles, which there's an untold number of vehicles that folks need to replace or um, have repaired. It can help with medical and dental expenses related to the disaster. And it helps people to um, obtain the first year of flood insurance on their property, um, which is a good thing. We're not a highly insured um, flood insurance county. We don't have a lot of flood history. 
Um, we are participatory as far as the flood insurance program goes, um, but encouraging folks to have flood insurance will help. However, even if you had flood insurance, it almost never covers 100% of a person's loss in a, in a water situation like this. On August 2nd, um, we requested on behalf of the city of Conover a public assistance damage assessment. That is for the bridges, roads, infrastructure damage that the municipalities have suffered. August 5th, um, we did the same thing for you all here in the city of Hickory. Those are both formal requests. We have heard that the uh, public assistance damage assessment is going to occur on Thursday and Friday in the county. Um, the state public assistance officials have told us that they're not sure yet whether we're going to qualify for federal declaration for public assistance for work on infrastructure or a state level declaration. So they're going to tour the damage, make their assessment, and then figure it out after they've seen everything. This afternoon, we were notified um, by the governor's office and by the U.S. Small Business Administration in Washington that Catawba County and the contiguous counties were approved for small business administration loans to individuals. Um, residents are going to be able to apply for those starting on August 8th at noon. Um, the center has been set up at the Catawba County Agricultural Resources Center in Newton. Transportation is available regardless of where you live in the county um, through Greenway Public Transportation. We talked to them a number of times and got that set up. Residents just have to call the number there on the screen um, to arrange for transportation if they do not, don't have a way to get to the Agricultural Resources Center. Even though we've gotten that Small Business Administration loan, we remain hopeful about the governor declaring Catawba County a state disaster area and getting that type one individual assistance. Um, I'm hoping that we'll hear that tomorrow um, so that we can do what's best for everybody um, all in one, one good fell swoop with that. The other arm of this that, that we're working across the county is a flood assistance partnership. Um, this is a group of nonprofit, volunteer, faith-based organizations that have banded together and say we want to wrap our arms around the citizens here. Um, and you will see names that you know on there. And they have been working hard since last Friday. Um, things available for folks that need help removing um, belongings from their home, tearing out walls, taking up floors, dehumidifying, treating mold, abating mold. Um, mental health referrals, uh, help with medical concerns and issues, food, clothing, whatever it is, this partnership is ready to address it. Um, a hotline opened over the weekend that folks can call. There's also a web res registration link that people can register. Um, and then the partnership will begin addressing their needs and, and working with them kind of in a case management type structure to, to put that out there. Um, and certainly, if there are other groups and organizations that wish to join in wrapping arms around the citizens, we encourage them to get a hold of the Catawba County United Way. They're kind of in processing any volunteers or groups that want to assist um, in this, this flood recovery process with the citizens. And the final thing I want to say is thank you to the City of Hickory. Um, a special thank you to the staff. Um, it has been a team effort across the county, but City of Hickory staff has been there the whole way. And uh, it's been a joy to work with them. I, I sadly have a few of their phone numbers totally memorized now. I um, hope that I don't have to use them much on a regular basis, but I do know that when I call them, it's an instant yes, what do you need? Um, and that's a wonderful, wonderful feeling, and you should be very, very proud of the staff. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions of Ms. Yowsey before we move her go? Is there anything we can do to help get uh, the governor to declare? <laughs> well, I'm certainly not going to discourage you, you from contacting your governor <laughs> in support of that. Um, I, well, we're not going to get through to him, but we probably can get through to Andy Wells and Austin Allran and Mick Setzer and uh, and some others. And I think we 
I'd encourage all of you to do it, and uh, I'm, I'm going to try to do it in the morning. Hopefully, um, he'll do the right thing. Maybe a little pushing. Um, I, I think the numbers are there. I think the documentation is there. I know certainly when, when people see the, the photos, and, and if you've had the opportunity to tour any of the area, um, you see it. And it, it's just incredible. Well, he came here right away when the damage he did. was still evidence. So. Yeah. Unfortunately, he didn't spend a lot of time boots on the ground in the county. Um, and, and so he was not able to see a lot of the damage. Um, hopefully through the media and, and other avenues, he's had some opportunities um, to see some of the damage because it is, it is tremendous. And the, the reports that we're getting from um, the public services people and the North Carolina Department of Transportation and those kinds of things are, we're not talking a few days on some of these projects. We're talking weeks, months, and in some one, two, three years to restore some of, some of the issues. And I know some of the families are suffering that same devastation personally. At this point, I'll call on uh, the city's public services director, Mr. Chuck Hansman. I know he's going to uh, tag team with uh, Chief Atkins and Chief Holler to kind of present the, the issues that the city of Hickory has in terms of public infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Barry. Mayor, members of council, first off, uh, I know on behalf of uh, the, the rest of us have been dealing with this. So thank you to Karen because don't, don't let her kid you. you uh, She's done a uh, yeoman's job here. Um, the numbers, a thousand year storm, a 1200 year storm, when they get that big, it doesn't really matter. Um, the, uh, an another way to, to say that is uh, we had a fifth of our annual rainfall in about a six hour period. And like Karen said, we already were saturated. Um, so there's, it was all, all runoff, 100% of it. Uh, we're going to bounce up and down on you. I'm going to do a little talking, and uh, Police Chief Atkins and uh, Police Chief Holler uh, are going to, going to fall in, and we're going to go back and forth a little bit. Um, I'm going to start with a, a little bit of a time frame. Obviously, uh, July 27th is. Uh, uh, the Saturday when this started, and, and again, our number, our phone started ringing uh, that morning, about daylight or so. Uh, before the morning was over with, uh, we had about 30-some people from our public services staff in at various places. That's public works, uh, street department mainly, and public utilities. 11 o'clock, 11.30 time frame, a state of emergency was declared by the city of Hickory. 12.30, we uh, set up essentially uh, an emergency operations center at uh, City of Hickory here. And so that was staffed and uh, information was coming to the field to, to the group that was working here in the uh, public information office and helping get the word, word out to, uh, uh, to the press. That, that uh, EOC remained uh, open, if you will, to about 8.30 that night and uh, send an information to, to council uh, mayor and uh, also information from the other cities and, and the county here. So that was, a, again, a, a group effort and communication back and forth and, and what was going on because we were all, all in, the, in looking for the same boat. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of communication taking place in that time frame. I'm actually let uh, Chief Atkins jump in here, and he's going to tell you. We're going to sort of walk you through the, some of the processes that day. Mayor, member of council, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Crone. So we're going to give you an overview of what the police department's involvement in this uh, in event was during that day. Uh, it kind of all started with our 911 center. Uh, the Hickory Police Department Communication Center is a secondary PSAP, uh, which is a 911 center where. If you dial 911 in Catawba County, it goes to the Catawba County Communications Center. That call is, is screened very briefly to see if they need police, fire, or EMS. If they need all three, they'll, they'll uh, dispatch police, or excuse me, they'll dispatch fire and EMS, and they'll transfer the call to the comm center in Hickory, uh, and we'll dispatch the appropriate resources through the police side. Um, our communication center is set up. We're a uh, um, 
24-7 operation. We uh, staff our uh, comp center, as you see on, on this picture there, usually a three-person uh, three staff uh, during, the, uh, uh, during the regular shifts. Uh, during peak shifts, it could go all the way up to four. And our minimum staffing level is at two. Uh, something unique about the police department is that uh, not only they take the 328551 calls that are non-emergency numbers and also the 911 calls, but they also take the administrative calls. Uh, after hours, if you dial our administrative line, it'll roll down to the comm center. Also, uh, unique is they are the public services call taking uh, backup. So after 3 p.m. on uh, Monday through Friday, all the way up to the following morning, at 7 a.m., if you call the public services uh, number, it'll roll to the police department comm center. And then on Saturday and Sunday, we are uh, the backup for a 24-hour period for those. So uh, needless to say, that morning, uh, we wasn't uh, prepared for all the calls. We were getting on the infrastructures, the road closings, the road, uh, um, uh, all, all different infrastructure failures that occurred. But uh, those three individuals took those calls. Uh, promptly got the information. Now, you're going to hear an example about three or four calls that the, uh, they handled that day. The key is you have to understand that you'll hear just a lot of matter of fact. Those folks are just getting the information back to the old uh, Adam 12, just a fact, ma'am, and uh, or sir, and we're, we're getting to the next call because they were overwhelmed with those calls coming in. Also, with those calls coming in, they're calling out public services. So they're calling public services with that information. So you may you may think that they sound very, you know, matter of fact, but they are. That's what they have to do to get the next call. There's not a lot, whole lot of chit chat going on uh, with these uh, communicators. Now you're going to hear uh, four calls, and you'll hear some uh, dead space there. We have redacted the caller's phone numbers. We redacted their information, any identifying any identifying information that you may hear. So we're going to give this a shot, right? All right. for property, but also uh, she was fearful for her life and her children's life. Thank you. Thank you. 
I think later on in the presentation you'll actually see some of these uh, uh, calls that uh, these folks are making. I think Mr. Hanson is going to have actual pictures of where they are located. Saturday uh, on July 13th, which was two weeks prior to this event, uh, and then compare it to the day of the event. Uh, on the 13th, between 6 a.m. and 2 p.m., we had 245 calls we processed, meaning that calls coming in, calls going out, um, and then the total between in that 12-hour span was 425 calls for service. Uh, events in the computer aided dispatch is when uh, the telecommunicators enter something in, a, in the uh, in our computer aided dispatch, which requires a uh, a response to an event, whether it be a traffic crash or whether it be uh, direct traffic, whatever that may be. So on that Saturday, on the, uh, July 13th, we had 65 between the same 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. and then 119 on that 18-hour period. It uh, pretty much. Uh, went crazy that morning doubled um, as you can see 533 events in that, at uh, 6 a.m. 2 p.m. and then 743 uh, from that 12-hour period uh, the entries in the dispatch there again 166 for that uh, 6 a.m. 2 p.m. and then um, for that 12-hour period 228 Our police officer during that day, uh, total of 143 calls for, for service for that 12 hour period. Uh, 77 were non related uh, to weather, but 66 of those were. Um, the alarm calls were coming in because of the, the uh, electric uh, being out, uh, different things happening there. Uh, obviously, when you have water on the roadways, you have traffic crashes. And the remainder of those calls were, were uh, officers going out, checking on roadways for public services, checking on uh, directing traffic for those uh, individuals to help um, fire and EMS uh, and public services get to where they need to be. So that was our involvement in this event. And I think that Chuck comes back up. Thank you, Chief. Uh, I'm going to run through some slides, but I want to talk just a minute before that. Um, 
Again, I'm very proud of the way all of our crews work together, uh, police, fire, public services, uh, and, and talking with both chiefs. Uh, I think they feel the same, the great communication back and forth. As they were getting calls, they were sending them us. We, we basically ended up manning a uh, telephone at our shop just to receive the calls from the police department. Uh, and then, of course, they were, they were going out of our shop uh, to our crews and so forth. Um, going forward, we're going we're to time frame flop back and forth here a little bit too, but going forward, we do expect to find more problems as sort of normal with a flood scenario. Some of these issues don't rear their head for a few weeks or months down the road. Uh, there's damage done, but it doesn't, doesn't really show itself. Um, so from from that standpoint, Saturday and Sunday were really most of our, our time was spent in the emergency situation trying to protect uh, folks in the traveling public, keep them out of harm's way, get things closed down, uh, just stabilize the situation best we could and let, let Mother Nature, you're, you're not going to stop that situation. You just have to keep, keep people out of the way of it. And uh, so we were, we were basically, that was pretty much the mode for uh, most of Saturday and on in on into to Sunday to some extent. At the uh, at the same time, um, we had one subdivision cut off, ridge washed out, and they had about seven homes in there totally cut off. Uh, and we'll we'll talk about that one on the slides here a little bit later. But uh, we jumped into a little different mode for that one because we really had to figure out how to get those people in and out and and for themselves our, our uh, emergency services. On uh, Monday, uh, our public services crews, uh, utilities and street predominantly, set about going through and, and inspecting their systems. The, the water had receded. We've been able to, to look at what we had. Uh, since that time frame, we've been in, inspecting uh, essential all of our storm drain systems, which we essentially did this past spring. We do that annually anyway. This is a follow-up because when you have this kind of damage, it, it uh, again, uh, has a tendency to, to obviously blow things apart, stop things up, damage things. So you really got to go out and look, look for that. And right now we're up in the in the 250 number of, of places that we have some type of repair and damage to. Uh, some some of those major, some some not. Um, we have about 38,000 storm drainage structures out there. That's boxes, pipes, uh, from segment to segment. So there's, there's a lot. And that's, that's what's in public right-of-way. Uh, you heard Karen talk a little bit about the, pub, uh, the private side. What I'm talking about is essentially the public side, what, what's within the streets right-of-way that the city's responsible for. Um, and again, some of, some of those small ones for what we put together and part of what we'll be talking when we meet with the, with the folks Friday <clears throat> that Karen talked about, uh, we're, we're probably uh, well over half a million dollars on, on just those small ones adding up together, and that's, that's not some of the ones I'm going to talk about in the slideshow here. This is a uh, Real similar to the to shop Karen showed you, and uh, knowing uh, what she had. This is 20th Avenue Southeast. Those of you who've been down to uh, our sludge compost facility in the past, uh, out near past Sunbelt Trucking, that's the road. Um, they're basically sitting in the edge of it, shooting right, right out of the windshield of the truck. Uh, and again, that was uh, a little bit a little bit later in the storm. So that's that's. What some of the some of the roadways you heard about, what they look like. That's that's there's curb and gutter and drainage and all that. And of course, in that kind of that kind of rain, drainage doesn't do much. All right, here's here's the Wind Ridge subdivision. One of the, one of the uh, probably our largest damage uh, that we, we've got to wrestle with. The house that you see in the back. There's about seven houses back here. This is their only way in and out. Uh, this is still Saturday morning. Uh, the rain had pretty much stopped, but this was flowing water. This is actually Snow Creek. Water's running uh, right to left in this picture. This is the bulkhead of the pipe that uh, used to be in there. You can see the elevation of the road, sidewalk. This uh, is a water line that uh, essentially was washed away. Here's a, a little, little different picture. Of essentially the same thing. Here's your water line again. Uh, the yellow is the gas. These are uh, power lines. 
t uh, telephone lines, power line on the other side. So anybody want to see what a sort of a cross section of a road system look like? There, there it is. This is looking upstream just a little bit. You can sort of see the gas line again. This is during the still during the event. You see this little arch right here? That's the pipe. This this was the road elevation right right across here. So not only is this gone, but it's as wide as as wide as what you see here. Here's what it looked like after the uh, rain went down. Uh, this is this is Sunday or Monday. This uh, this is Monday, I believe. Um, Here's the structure, and here again you can see that little arch where the, the pipe had set in there, and uh, this is moving downstream. This is the upstream. This is uh, you can see power trucks in here discussing how to, how to uh, again start getting some emergency temporary services back into these folks. Uh, utilities crews beginning to to work on uh, getting temporary water and sewer in. This is downstream. If, if you take this shot and you look to the right, if you will, that's what it looks like. So all of that debris is just downstream 100 feet or less. Uh, the creek normally runs right, right through here. Now it's sort of peeling off and coming around and coming back into itself. So uh, kind of hard to see, but there's a piece of that water line that's, that's missing right there. This is just standing down near the creek here. It gives you some idea. This is about a 20 foot, it's about 20 foot across here. It gives you some idea what size that hole is. Uh, this backdrop behind you would easily fit in it. Uh, and so that gives you some magnitude of, of what, what this size is. Uh, again, power crews are beginning to put some overhead to get the bridge across. Here's our utility crews. They're, this is just upstream of the failure. The bridge is washed out down here. They're, work, they're working on welding up a caisson pipe to, to basically bridge the, bridge the creek to run the temporary utilities across. Here's that pipe in place. Again, here's the upstream structure. Here they are beginning to uh, basically feed, feed the temporary uh, water, sewer, in this case gas, through that caisson. Uh, this is, uh, again, working around the clock, if you will. This is uh, obviously getting dark on them, but you can see the, see the pipes beginning to go in place. And here's what it looks like uh, sort of in, as an end product. Here's where you saw that backhoe working to start with off the hill. Here's the pipe in place, and those other ones are inside that carrier pipe, if you will, uh, un under the stream. And it comes back up on, on the side I'm standing on here. While this was going on, uh, while this was going on, essentially all of these services, water, sewer, gas, power, telephone, was all back in place Tuesday at noon. Uh, during the rain event, and shortly thereafter on Saturday, we knew obviously these folks were cut off. Uh, engineering folks began contacting some property owners and they worked out an agreement with three property owners, some of which live in the subdivision, uh, essentially how to get a temporary road into these folks. So Sunday morning at seven o'clock, this started. Uh, a little bit of grading taking place through the woods, if you will. A little more grading taking place through the woods. We get in the shape of a road, working in. We basically worked around the big trees and property lines to get in. Uh, beginning, you can see actually that sort of opens up a little bit. That's, that's sort of back into the subdivision area. Just, just grading. Uh, again, it's pretty pretty curvy little street. It's about 800 feet long, two, two three football fields long. Uh, here's sort of where it ties in the back of one of the cul-de-sacs. And so again, we had equipment, construction equipment and access going in here even, even wise in this stage. Next step was to get some fabric down. And again, this was Sunday morning, so everything was still soaking wet as it had been. So we had to get some fabric and some large surge stone, uh, almost riprap down. A little, little better shot of that. That's what the size stone, that's the base layer of this, this material looks like. Uh, there's your uh, ABC or crusher run going on, in on top of it. Sort of the evolution of the road through the woods, sort of more of the end product. 
and tying into subdivision. So essentially, that's what these people are using in in and out of their uh, subdivision now. How, so, how long did it take us to build that road? Uh, we had a, we had equipment going in and out on Monday morning. We pretty much got it to dirt opened up stage Sunday night. Monday morning, we had we were able to get some of our construction equipment in on the other side of you know this side of the creek. And, and again, some some of that stone was going. Essentially, everything was done by Tuesday at noon. Power and road work. So, I'm real real pleased with what what our guys accomplished. So a day and a half. About a day. Basically, yeah, yeah, it was accessible. Totally finished about a little, little bit longer than that, but almost. Um, the next set groups of slides are all over. Hickory and some even outside of Hickory. A couple of them you you probably heard a call along. Uh, this is Pinecrest Drive, Cobb Springs. What you have here is a road washout. This is this is the curb and gutter, the line of curb and gutter. This white pipe is the water line that's actually under the curb and gutter. Uh, and some of these some of these calls. Not only were our folks blocking the roads off, but we were trying to protect what infrastructure was there at the same time so this steel beam we keep some of these in our backyard everybody's got to have a little bit of a storage pile and this this is what we keep sometimes uh, you drop this beam off you span the you span the, the wash out you strap the water line up and uh, hope she stays together on you so that's uh, again a little, little different little different look at the hole but uh, this water line got shut down for a little bit to get things in place and so that water line's up and live and running nobody's out of water everybody still has access in this case because it's sort of a loop loop road in there uh, here's here's essentially a storm drain pipe this is an 84 inch storm drain pipe so you know it's something I can walk through um, she separated can't really tell here but but it's separated right back back here this is looking downstream, so again, the creek itself uh, uprooted debris. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty much standing right here on the edge looking, looking off downstream. Cripple Creek, this is uh, 6th Street Northwest right here, uh, the new sidewalk that, that's out there. Uh, we had this kind of thing in most places. Uh, something washed out, end up to the next, next thing downstream that caught it. In this case, it was the... Uh, culverts at, uh, at 6th Street. Uh, so all of this week we've been investigating and finding and looking and removing as much of this stuff as we can. Uh, obviously getting ready for the next rain event. So that's, that's what we've been doing nonstop. This is a uh, 7th Avenue Southwest. This is inside the pipe looking upstream. So that's the, in uh, I'm sorry, that's the inlet of the pipe. So again, as this water came to it, came to the pipe systems, or even receded, some of this stuff, old dead wood in various places, it floated, got washed down to, to the inlets. And so uh, again, this is an example of this pipe's in good shape, it's just that it stopped up. This is being cleared, for example. But th these are some of the things that we'll continue to find and look for. Uh, but that's, you know, 90% blocked right there. Uh, firing range bridge. This goes over to the police firing range. A um, couple of shots here. What, what's kind of hard to distinguish in this is here's the creek level. And again, this was after the event. But if you see this debris up here and there's debris in this steel truss system, the water level was up here. As it recedes, this is standing on the bridge looking down and, and that looks like a long way down. It is a long way down. It's, it's 25, 30 feet down. Uh, so that's give you some idea how, how high this is a narrow, steep little creek run through here and, and river run through here. This debris, again, uh, underneath the bridge, this has been pulled out and removed. A lot of, a lot of that type of activity going on. Uh, the bridge has been inspected. It's safe. It's back open. A lot of mud and stuff on the, on the roadway has been removed. This is a 18-inch um, sewer line. Uh, there's a storm drain that runs from the top of the hill that comes down this way underneath this towards towards the quarry. This sewer line is sort of in a little flat area that runs just like you see on the page. This storm drain washed out. 
So you had a little bit of a slide, almost a little bit, well, you might think of as a little bit of a slide here. Now what it did, it took this section of, of sewer line out. So this is, uh, this is one of the calls that we received, uh, and I say one of the calls, one of the calls we received from our own crews checking on some things. This was uh, found uh, Saturday afternoon. to see here uh, but this is Sunday morning at about four or five o'clock uh, a.m. <laughs> obviously uh, these are two power poles spanning that they're laying across here if you will so it's two power poles this is a new piece of sewer line strapped in and we're in the process of sealing this up. A little bit of sewer still flowing right there, and they, that's been sealed up. So again, this was the temporary fix to put this hole back together and keep that sewer flowing. Did uh, you do this the engineer drawings on that? <laughs> <laughs> Farmer ingenuity on this one. Uh, the, uh, and, and again, I'm proud of our crews for getting things back, back and open and for all the, all the reasons they, they needed to. Um, This one has been bid, is actually under construction, under the repair is already taking place. Uh, they're working yesterday, late in today. Uh, that one is about, round numbers, a $55,000 fix. Here's a uh, driveway pipe. It just happens to be the driveway pipe going into our Henry Fork wastewater treatment plant. Uh, it's pretty important to get our trucks in and out of there. This one's deep off the bank, uh, 20 plus feet down. Again, a lot of water came, came out. It sort of self-destructed. A couple of these joints started leaking, water running over top, and, and essentially came apart. Not a large pipe, not a ton of water in most normal situations. In this case, uh, this, one, this one has been bid and is scheduled. Same crews going from the sewer project on the last one over this one. This one's about a $22,000, $23,000 fix because of the depth of it. Somebody called in on the chief's uh, line a minute ago and talked about water shooting everywhere. Well, there it is. <laughs> uh, this, this is this is the one on Grace Church Road you heard. Uh, what you can't see is the roads washed out right here. Uh, here's a little different view of the same same one. Here's the here's the uh, water line. In this case, it's it's uh, failed a little bit more. And in this case, it's, she's spraying down instead of up. But uh, so. This is a case where this is a North Carolina Department of Transportation roadway. This is not ours, out in, out in the county. But again, our uh, utility lines are, are involved in, in some of these out in the county. Uh, Plateau Road, and, and again, this, this one's out sort of uh, below Highway 10, uh, out past Mountain View area. Plateau Road water line, this one's the, the in that same area below Fred T. Ford. Um, a lot of washing took place in this case, and again, you can sort of see it deposited down the creek a little bit. When you look off the bridge, here's a water line. What you can't really tell in this picture is this bank used to come around here and come up under like this. All of this was underwater, or excuse me, under dirt. This was dug in and installed, and then it turned down and came across the creek. So it was buried in the creek bottom, but this was all bank and stabilized. This is all washed out, and that's part of what you see downstream. This is a communication conduit that was again bored under under the creek bed to uh, to install it. So uh, this one was leaking a little bit from the hammering it took. Uh, crews responded to that and had it had it back going uh, uh, Sunday also. It was, it was leaking in, the, in a joint here. Huffman Farm Road out uh, just south of Mountain View a little bit off 127. Uh, another failure from a from a, a cross pipe storm drain failure. Uh, we have a water line right here that runs through this hole. This one's a, a little tough to see, but it, it's one of those time of day sun in your eyes photo. Uh, this is actually sitting on Lake Hickory, looking at a bank in La Point subdivision. Uh, this is essentially private property. What you don't see in this picture is we have a small pump station over here. It serves about seven, eight, nine houses. 
So there's a sewer line that runs right to left across here to feed this pump station, and there's a force main that pumps sewer back out this way. This bank sloughed off, and it's pretty steep. Um, couldn't enough, steep enough that you couldn't get near the edge of it. You had to put a boat in the water to go look at it from the downstream side, downhill side. There's a sewer line runs in this bank. It's not exposed yet, but again, left unintended, it will be. So, uh, so that gives you a little bit of a flavor of, of what we're dealing with. This is Tate Boulevard. Um, you can see it's sort of a box culvert that goes under Tate Boulevard right here. This, this area was a, a, a hole that existed. The water came in from about four different directions to it and then ran under Tate Boulevard towards the south. What this rain has done is it's washed this out and it's washed this bank and of course this hole is opened up all, all back in here. What we're doing in, we're setting a, we're setting a beam right here. Uh, that's a water line, 12 inch uh, ductile iron water line that we're basically gonna strap up and, and protect and, and uh, is still in service. Uh, here's a, a picture of our Henry or Hickory Catawba wastewater treatment plant. This is the, the plant that we're building down uh, in Catawba. Again, it's kind of tough to see, but, but the normal creek's right out here, sort of where that big tree looks like out there. It's the other side of that big tree. Where the dozer's sitting and the track hoe and all that, that's construction area. And, and once this plant's done, it'll be up here at this elevation, but this is, a, this is the building of it. Obviously, you can see the floodwaters in here around it. Uh, here's another view. Here's the dozer that's sitting in the water in the track hoe. Uh, this is beginning one of the clarifiers. But again, all, all of this is flooded the main, main creeks out here. So that's uh, what some of our existing construction projects are dealing with in this scenario too. Uh, some of you heard about, this, this one isn't ours, but you heard about a washout over at CVCC. Thought I'd throw a shot of that in. This is the uh, multi-purpose building, sits right in here. Uh, washouts, this area. Looking at it from here, as you see the multi-purpose building, uh, water lines uh, in here, and again, there's a storm drain that failed underneath that, that, that blew that out. So that's, that's a little bit of a flavor of what we're dealing with and what we're finding and what we'll continue to find. Uh, but again, we're up in the 250 to 270 range on some of those blocked up storm drains, box culverts come apart, you gotta have some brickwork done, uh, but we'll be meeting with the, with the folks uh, Friday to explain some of this to them and show them some of it. But uh, uh, Pine Crest that we saw, uh, we're getting bids on it this week. The process that I, that I didn't talk about, just elaborate just a little bit on the, on the subdivision, Wind Ridge. We're uh, working with an engineering firm on a proposal to do a design uh, for that bridge replacement and whatever option that is, uh, we'll see. But that's probably a nine to 12 month project by the time you design it, bid it, build it, put it back in service. So that one's, that one's a uh, few months away yet, even though we've started on it. Um, Chief Hall? All right. I'll be very brief, but a couple things. We talked about the storm itself and how bad it was, but um, the one thing that we really found, we, we talk a lot about our citizens and the county, our people being resilient. Well, we were finding on our calls that we were going to, that a lot of the neighbors who had water in their basements or they had a flood and just in the house and everything, we found that the neighbors that didn't have problems had, <laughs> they were barefooted in their right helping each other. That was one of the biggest things that really hit home with me. And fortunately, or unfortunately, uh, I had five inches of water in my basement when this all happened. And if I hadn't had some good neighbors, because I had to wind up coming in here, if I hadn't had some good neighbors, I'd have been in trouble too. So I think I really wanted to mention that because I think it, it really says a lot about our community of how they jumped in to help each other. Uh, another thing is too is I think immediately that city administration knew that the emergency operations center needed to be open and it was open very quickly and it was run appropriately. Uh, I think that, that helped tremendous. Um, on the average, and you'll see up here on, on the slide, and this is in a six hour period of time, we had 59 calls for service and, and at that particular time, 32 of them were uh, weather related. 
we average in one or two year period, we'll average maybe one or two water rescues in a one, two year period. In a six hour period, we did 12 within the city, 12 water rescues. These were out of vehicles, people that had just driven into the water and then had gotten too deep. And, and I've always said, and a lot of you heard in the neighborhood college, I'm, I'm awful bad to say that we have some very good people in Hickory, but we tend to run into one another motor vehicle accidents that was another thing that was tremendous there was a lot of there was a lot of vehicle traffic on, on, the, on that saturday which uh, uh, equated to some accidents that we had to run we had a lot of power lines down the hazardous materials calls and runoff that we're talking about a lot of uh, propane tanks uh, we had some gasoline tanks that had, had leaked and was actually flowing into creeks and in the streets and then we had a lot of just absolutely service calls to where we had to go out and check on some of the seniors uh, because they, they were having problems for one reason or another, so we did, we did a lot of that. But in a six-hour period, we had 59 calls. Now, in the eight-hour period after that, we, we, we processed another 52 calls, but they were all service-related. Uh, here again, checking on the seniors. We had a lot of water in basements and that kind of thing that, that, we, that we had to deal with. This slide right here it depicts uh, one of the water rescues. Uh, this was at uh, Valley Hills Mall, the parking lot. And you can see now that's down there close to Belks at the parking deck. That's where that she drove in and it just absolutely overtook the car. And, uh, she was in a bad way. And we actually had to go in there and do just that, get her out of that. Um, usually during a thunderstorm, uh, we, we do have a, a more of a demand for service uh, just to the total number of calls, usually the lightning and that kind of thing. This had really didn't have, we didn't have to deal with that, it was just water. Tremendous amount of water seemed to be everywhere. Um, and, and, and I think that, that was it. We were, we were getting water coming in, in homes, power lines. And, and one of the things that we had to deal with personally, too, we had a fire station taking on water, took on quite a bit of water, our station one downtown. So in the, all of this, we were dealing with that at the same time. Um, also during this on the south side of town, we had a house, a structure that was on fire that took about an hour and a half during this six hour period to actually extinguish that, find them help, get them a place to stay because it was still just pouring down rain at, the, at that particular time when this is all going down. So it took, it took quite a bit of time to, to really help the people and get them, get them the help that they needed at that particular time. And just making sure that some of the residents were okay because we had, we had a list, a backlog of calls of people that, that had water in their basements, water in their homes, and it, it just took us a while to get there. Uh, and they were very patient because we didn't run into anybody that was out at all. Everybody was very patient. I, I think they knew that everybody and their brother was busy. The neighbors were helping. It was a tremendous uh, effort by everybody. It only helped us a little bit that this happened on a Saturday morning, too. That's true. That's true. Because it helped us with traffic more than anything in the world. Um, and, and two, during all of this, Normally on a Saturday morning, just to give you an idea of the 59 calls in that six hour period, and then we had 52 calls in the eight hours preceding that, just to give you an idea, in that particular time on a Saturday with nothing going on, you're looking at probably eight or nine calls in that period of time for a Saturday, usually anywhere from eight to nine would have been the average for that, uh, say, 18 hour period. And that covers everything. <laughs> And you know it, that that was the that was the odd part too was here we were we were trying to get out there and help everybody else but we were running into the same thing that everybody was too there was holes that were coming uh, the potholes the, the holes on the side of the road the flooding the, the the creeks were out of their banks we had bridges that we couldn't get across we had roads we couldn't get in some that we had to literally cut ourselves to cut trees out of the way to get in so it was uh, it was a tremendous effort I think. Uh, Police, fire, and public services, and, and, I, and I use them as our first responders. That's I, when I say that I really mean that. <coughs> we have made contact all but one. Uh, we we made contact with all the residents that we ran calls on Saturday, except for one. Uh, she is living with her. We found out finally today 
She's with her sister in uh, Virginia, so we, we know she's okay. But we made, went back and made contact with all the people that we dealt with on Saturday to make sure that they had the help that they needed. And uh, they knew where to file and, and get that help. Uh, here again, I, I think the city's approach to the emergency operations center was probably one of the best moves that we made early on, absolutely. Because I think it served, it, it served several things. First of all, it was, we were able to gather the information because we were all sitting right there. Uh, all the calls were coming in to different divisions. We were able to put them together and, and, and actually add them up and we knew where everything was at any particular time. It also gave us an opportunity to get the word out, but factual, factual word out to all the public. So I, I think it helped us tremendously. The third thing, and Karen really hit on this, it, it kept us totally involved with Catawba County and the municipalities and, and helped us on the state of emergency, when to do it, how to do it, and so that we followed all the rules to where we are going to be eligible, hopefully, for money and some help. So I think that, that, that was just tremendous, that call there. We're going to try our best to review our total process that we went through to make sure that how we handled it was appropriate. We we're going back with our emergency operation plan or reviewing it uh, to make sure, it, it, or is there anything that we learned out of all of this? So I think that we'll do that during this period of time. Uh, with that, I, I think it's one other thing is just to say thank you to the community itself for helping us do our job. I think they were tremendous in that. And I would be glad to answer any questions if I can or if I can. Thank you all. I've really done a thorough job. Thank you very much. I, I had a question for Mr. Hanson. Are you, are you, I'm sorry. You I'm not done yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. You may answer. You may answer. Um, and one thing following up on the chief, the other, the other thing that I think helped with the traffic issue and, and again it sort of started as a rainy Saturday morning and, and grew worse from there is the county sent out a, a call to everybody that said, you know, don't be out unless you really have to. And uh, I think that helped us as, as the day went on also. So that, that was uh, again using, using technology uh, a little to, to help us out. And these are a, a few little Somebody else inserted these slides on me, so uh, I'll, I'll let you read them. Uh, but again, a few thank yous uh, uh, for, for the for the staff, if you will. Um, one of the, the bottom one is is for one of, one of the uh, ladies in Windridge subdivision. Uh, couldn't believe how how quick things went back together for them, and, and uh, we, we appreciate that. Uh, this one is. Uh, really uh, should be turned around and, and sent to Karen to be honest with you because she's she's uh, been a, a go-to resource for all of us not just City Hickory but all, all the municipalities and the county and like I promised you we're going to jump all around just a little bit in this presentation I'm gonna go back to a timeline here just a little bit um, on Sunday we said, okay, let's sort of continue to close the loop up a little bit. And, you know, it was a nice, pretty sunny day. Uh, we came in at two to four and, and evaluated the situation, see where, see what had changed uh, in you know almost the, the last 20 hours since we'd we'd been there and listened to the reports from from uh, the departments and uh, put together an update for council as well as, well as the media. And then uh, 29th and 30th, we let the citizens know. Uh, some of the information on how to report some of this this damage information again that's sort of in in working with with Catawba County on, on some of that information uh, July 31st uh, when uh, Governor McCrory came in uh, pro tem uh, guest was able to meet with him at Dunn Lincoln Airport along with some of the staff uh, got a chance to hear what some of our issues were and and yeah, we do we do need some help. It's that bad. So uh, there was a little face-to-face -face time and face-to-face and -face request with that um, state of emergency uh, was actually terminated. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but they were calling for a pretty decent rain event to come in after this one. And thank goodness it, we, we had a little bit of rain, but it wasn't what they called for. 
So uh, from, from that standpoint, uh, August 1st, we uh, terminated the state of emergency. And again, here, here we are today continuing to, to work on finding issues and scheduling work, prioritizing, and, and uh, working on what we've already found. So that's all I got. Now, the, now questions. What, what I was thinking was, due to this, we know now where our weakest points were obviously by the damage that was done so my question is uh related to those infrastructures and those weakest points when we put those back do we put those back the same way that they were or do we put them back differently now knowing that this could happen that it happened in that location before and that if we have another incident such as that that they're prone i, I would imagine that they're prone to the same thing again so my question is do we put them back differently or do we put them back the same as they were? The answer to that is probably both. Uh, and the reason being, in some cases, uh, some of what our problems stem from was you're not going to put a system in that handles that kind of water. You, you don't design for a thousand year storm. You can't afford to design for a hundred year storm and build it. I mean, it's, in, in most cases, many pipes are constructed under roadways for a 25 year storm. That's sort of the norm. Uh, if it floods a little bit, you let it go down and you deal with it. In this case, it was it was so so far out of proportion and in terms of the rain we got in that given amount of time, you're, you're not going to put a system out there that will handle it. The other compound factor that was is you have this debris washing down and clogging things up. You you really can't can't do much with that in, in, in this situation. But, but trying to answer your question, a lot of this will go back in in virtually about the same sizes that it was. Um, and if you get this kind of storm, it, it may do this again. But part of it has to do with, uh, for example, uh, Windridge. We may not replace that with a 20-foot culvert, if you will. That may go in as a bridge. And that's, that's some of the evaluation we'll do uh, through this. So trying to answer your question, it's probably some of both. Where, where it makes sense and, and, and you can do that uh, in the long term, to put something uh, in that'll help withstand a little bit of this uh, type storm scenario, then yeah, we're going to do that. At the same standpoint, when you start changing sizes of things, upstream and downstream, you usually have comments about that. So we, we got to be cognizant of what, what that really does to the rest of the, of the, uh, the flow scenario. Obviously, we're not going to downsize anything. Uh, but, but in some cases, there may be a little, little upsize. In some cases, you can't do it because, like the one in Catawba, or in Pinecrest, Catawba Springs, you saw sewer lines and other conflicts that we got to sneak between. And so that, that, that size fits and everything else was built around it, so you can't really upsize that because of other constraints that you have there. Other questions? Good job, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Well, uh, you've heard from those folks. I also want to point out Andrew Surratt was the, she was the go-to person to make sure all of this got carried off correctly. Uh, Mr. Bird was in Alaska. Oh, did I say that? You did. <laughs> but you know, and the good I, and thing I was. about it is he was in Alaska and we took care of this. And the only person that had any, any bad word for him was his wife, who had to clean out their basement. <laughs> uh, but that's the way we want to do it. We want to be set up so that if something happens, I was, I was not able to be there to meet with the governor. Mr. Guess did great. So, uh, so I, I'm happy with the way things went under the circumstances. It was a difficult time. And uh, Mr. Burry, you had a well-deserved vacation. Thank you, sir. Mr. Helton. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. Are you going to make a motion to? Uh, I move we approve uh, Mr. Helton's speech. Okay. Motion by Mr. Seaver, second by Mrs. Patton. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. That motion's approved. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Councilman. Uh, <laughs> I like to thank these people for going before me because they made the perfect example of why you should keep Grace House. Imagine yourself homeless out in the tent during this type of weather. Grace House is the only place that you can go to wash your clothes and take a bath and dry everything that you have. If you close down Grace House, 
these play people have no place to go. And another thing, if you close down Grace House right now, their, meet, their needs are being met through Roger's uh, program and my helping with the uh, with the veterans through the American Legion and the D D A V. Um, we work with them. We we've got two going to, two veterans going to school now, starting 15th of this month. One's taking electrical course and one's taking welding. I got a Marine and his wife out of the tent, moved us to Solomon in an apartment. So they're out of the woods. Thank God for that. Now, what I'd like to say is that uh, if it wasn't for Grace House, these people would have nowhere to go. They would not. And they would. their needs would not be met. If it wasn't for that, you would have high crime rate. Your police would be busy because they would meet their own needs. They would break into people's houses and get what they need. They would steal. They would kill to get what they need. By Grace House being there, we can provide their needs. And I think that you ought to think about that before you decide to close Grace House. If you just, if that's on the agenda, which I do not know, and I want to read you. The Pledge of Allegiance. A lot of you say the Pledge of Allegiance and don't even know what it means. The Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance. I promise to be true to the flag, to the symbol of our country. Of the United States of America, each state that has joined to make our country. And to the Republic. A Republic is a country where the people choose others to make laws for them. The government is for the people. For which it stands, the flag means the country. One nation, a single country. Under God, the people believe in a supreme being. Indivisible, the country cannot be divided into parts. With liberty and justice, with freedom and fairness, for all, for each person in the country. And that means the homeless as well. I want to thank you for listening to me and also have two books I go by. The Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States and the Holy Bible. Jesus Christ, when he was on earth, I don't know if no, most of you know this, but he was homeless. He had nowhere to lay his head. And he said that as you do this to these, the least of my brothers, you do it unto me. So if you close down Grace House, you're closing it down to Jesus Christ because we believe that he said where one or two or three are gathered together, there I am also. And at Grace House, we gather in the name of Jesus Christ. So there he is. And he said, what you do to the least of these my brothers, you do it unto me. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, City Council. And I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Mr. Wood, quarterly financial report. Mayor Wright, members of the City Council, Mr. Barry, Mr. Crone. Um, tonight we do have our quarterly finance report for the last quarter of FY 12-13. These are what I'm going to go over and show you tonight are unaudited numbers and, and actually somewhat incomplete because we continue to, to pay invoices that come in in late June into July. We pull them back into June. We also continue to collect sales tax revenue in July and August. So this report will be absent uh, those, those uh, items, but other than that, you get a good, pretty good picture of how we did in both the general fund and the water and sewer fund over the course of the last in the last year. We will have the annual audit to you uh, later in the fall. They're, they're working now on that. We will start taking a look at the, uh, the general fund, how we've done with 100% uh, of the year complete. Um, the general fund is a $45 million fund, about 50% of your overall budget. We've received just over 89% of our budgeted revenues, and the five-year average says we ought to be at 93%. And there's a reason for that difference. If you recall, when we adopted the FY 
2012-13 budget, uh, budget, you appropriated $2.5 million in fund balance to put towards capital reserve to meet our five-year CIP needs. And what's happening is the way the accounting system works, that actually works against us on the revenue, on the revenue side. And I'll show you in the bottom line. I'll clean it all up for you on a more apples-to-apples -apples comparison on the bottom line. But when you take that anomaly out, we're really where we need to be in terms of what our five-year average says. On the expenditure side, we have spent or encumbered uh, almost 95% of our budgeted uh, expenditures. Our five-year average says we ought to be about 93.5%. And looking at the bottom line, what all that means, when you look at our revenues over expenditures, we have actually spent about a half a million dollars more than we've collected. And our five-year average says we ought to be at about 200,000 more, more, more revenue collected than, than expended. Again, going back to that $2.5 million number, I know I'm getting a lot into the weeds here, but when you, when you look at a more apples-to-apples -apples comparison, we're probably a million dollars to the good which is comparable to where we were at this point last year, if that makes sense. So, so in essence, even a further bottom line, your goal is to have a 25% fund balance and ideally put a little bit of money back into fund balance every year. And FY 11-12, which is very similar to this year, we put about 300000 back into fund balance. That would be a good target number of what we're probably looking at, if that makes sense. That's the bottom line. And we would maintain our 25% fund balance goal in the general fund. Any questions so far? Okay. Just some general fund highlights since we've completed the year for FY 1213. Again, we did set aside uh, money to continue funding our five-year CIP for the next few years. Uh, we offered a retirement incentives program this past year. We had 34 takers. We did it two years ago. We had 20 uh, folks that uh, accepted the, the offering. Um, and again, this is a, a goal to try to control costs. Uh, we feel like that was effective. Uh, the hiring freeze continued, although it's, it's, it's um, more targeted now than, than across the board. Uh, and at any given time, we probably have between 30 and 35 vacancies in the city. Uh, revenue collections were stable for the second year in a row, and that's a, good, that's a good thing because we couldn't say that a few years ago. And really two really good pieces of information. Uh, we experienced two years of decline in our tax base. Well, this year it, it grew. It grew slightly, but we avoided our third uh, decline in tax base. Um, and mo that was mostly due to an increase in our uh, uh, business personal property, more so than on the, the real property side. But, but nonetheless, our tax base did grow slightly. And in addition to that, our property tax collection rate increased um, for the first time in about 10 years. And I'll show you a slide uh, the next one. This is our property tax collection rate going back to 2002, 2003. And you can see it's just a very slight decline. And then we hit the most recent recession and it continued to decline and it really dropped off last year. This is the first measurable increase we've had in this span. Um, so that's a, that's a good sign. If we could put two or three years together of our collection rate increasing, uh, we think that would be a, a good a good a good sign for us. Every tenth of a percent that our collection rate drops, we lose twenty five thousand dollars in current year collections. So that's a significant um, number. Moving to the water and sewer fund. The water and sewer fund is a twenty three million dollar fund. Makes up um, about twenty five percent of your overall budget. We'll take a look at how how they're doing this year. A little bit different story in the water and sewer fund. Uh, with 100% of the year complete, they've collected 98.5%. Again, there are some revenues that will be collected or that were collected in July that aren't reflected here. Uh, the five-year average says they'll be at about 93%. So they did, they did better on the revenue side. Uh, on the expenditure side, uh, spent or encumbered 88% of the budgeted expenditures. The five-year average says they'll be about 92%. So Kevin's gonna, done a good job of holding the line on the expenditure side in the water and sewer fund. And what that means for their bottom line, Kevin won't like this part because I'm going to explain this number away. Um, the revenues over expenditures in the water and sewer fund, just the straight math says they've collected $3.8 million more than they've spent. The five-year average, the five-year average says that they ought to be at 611,000. The reason this number is so high, three, three factors figuring into that. Number one, they had a tremendous amount of capital projects that were begun in the previous fiscal year that weren't complete that will roll over into the new year. 
and that combined with there was a debt service payment we thought was going to come due that was budgeted that did not and also there were uh, two one-time revenues that he received that are kind of inflating this number when you back those out they're still doing better than their five-year average but not nearly what it says what it says it is so kevin won't like that part of it but that's that's where that's where it is in the water sewer fund and again the water sewer fund had a very similar year to what it had the previous year so um so no no decline there it's a few highlights in the water and sewer fund we completed the northeast wastewater treatment plant last year bank began construction on the uh, hickory catawba wastewater treatment plant chuck had a picture of that hopefully it's not underwater uh we were, we were awarded a 2.9 million dollar grant from the state of North Carolina to install public sewer in uh, three neighborhoods in Northeast Hickory which are in our ETJ and there's no match on the city's part this is all st uh, strictly grant money so that'll be that'll start in this current in the current fiscal year that we're in uh, we replaced 3,000 feet of 80 year old water line uh, out near JC Park um, and this kind of went under the radar screen to some degree. We received an area-wide optimization award for being in the top 10 percentile in North Carolina for cleanliness of finished drinking water. So we have some of the cleanest drinking water produced by the water plant in the state of North Carolina. We received an award for it. And however, one, one thing we like for our water sales to grow obviously incrementally every year. Our year-over-year -year water sales were, were flat. A lot of conservation going on in uh, particularly on the res residential side just to give you an idea that uh, Chuck talked a lot about particularly uh, not only roadway damage but utility damage the total value of our utility system not our not the net assets but the total value of the assets is 130 million dollars um, so there's a tremendous amount of investment out there in our utility system and obviously they're very capital intensive in terms of replacing and maintaining um, and spend a disproportionate amount of their budget on on the capital side as compared to the as compared to the general fund okay and we'll switch gears a little bit here this is our total building permit values issued by fiscal year going back to 0405 I always have to explain this away this in FY0910 Catawba Valley Medical Center uh, got a 30 million dollar building permit for renovations when you when you take that out, it was really, which is non-taxable property, it was really about $50 million a year for us. This is a pretty amazing slide when you, when you take that $30 million permit out. This, I would say this is, this is our floor in terms of building permitting. We've been at about $50 million uh, for five years. So I'd say 50, 50 million is about the floor. And we, we like for this number to be 75 million, if not 100 million, where we were up here to really get some growth in our tax base. And we talk about that a lot. Uh, but this is, you know, this is a year-end numbers, and we entered it to almost 49 million. So that just kind of gives you an idea. We've been very consistent in our, in our permitting and our tax base in terms of uh, permits issued for, for uh, projects. Interestingly, though, I will say in July was a 16 million dollar month. Um, you know, three of those equals what we did the whole, the whole year. So I think 12 million of that was Carmike Theaters, but uh, we had a good month in, in July. Hopefully, that'll be the start of more good months and just finally the impact of state tax reform we talked about that a lot we were very concerned about what we saw going on in raleigh um, and here's the bottom line on what uh, is going to come out of that and what it means to us we're going to receive half of our hold harmless revenue from the state and this will be a loss of about one hundred and thirty thousand dollars it was scheduled to drop off last year we knew that um, we hope we, we we hope that they would continue to there's a long history to our whole harmless revenue we had hoped that they'd continue to to give us those funds but this current year will be the last year and we're only going to get half of what uh of what we should be getting or ha had hoped to get uh, so that'll be about a hundred and thirty thousand dollar hit to us that's the worst news in this picture utility franchise taxes are going to be eliminated but included in the sales tax base so the calculation is we're going to be pretty much even though they're eliminating the franchise tax, utility franchise taxes, we'll make up for it in, through the sales tax base. So that was kind of a wash. We were very concerned about the state um, doing away with local government's ability to, to have privilege licenses. Um, and there, there's no change to the privilege license system in the state. Additionally, we were concerned about our ability to get our, our tax refunds on the local government side, and they are not going to tamper with that. 
And finally, the league did a calculation on the impact of all the cities to the to the um, state tax reform. And really, it's a, it's a positive about 113,000 figure in the hold harmless, and it's it's pretty much a wash. Now, I will say what the Senate had been considering was going to be millions of dollars in revenue loss to us. So the, really the House didn't go along with that. And when they got together, this is what came out of it. So we did re very well um, not to get hit by the, the state uh, tax reform. But most of that loss, they were projecting that most of that loss would be offset by the consumption tax. Right. But we didn't have any idea what that number would be. There was. It would be like pass it, and then we'll find out what it does to us. Correct. And and they did not end up broadening the base like the Senate wanted to do, and they didn't lower the income tax rates as much as what the Senate wanted. So that was the final on that. And any questions or comments? I, I have one, but it's not directly related to that. I'm just curious uh, if you could briefly speak to the financial impact related to the flood and, and all the events that went on and how, I guess, real uh, brief uh, a scenario of what happens, how, where those funds come from. If the state, regardless of what they do, what's our next step financially? I'll, I'll start with, I'll go back a little further than that. We have set up, I'll give you in the weeds here, we've set up specific account codes to track all these expenditures. Um, and we will be coming back to you, if not the next meeting, the meeting after that, with budget amendments to put funds into those uh, line items to make sure we're, we're we've got money to cover it. We didn't want to do we didn't we wanted to make sure we had a good idea of what the numbers were before we did that. So that's why we're waiting a little bit. I know Conover went ahead and did some of that. Ultimately, we think the scenario that we're going to be in is that we will be able to get 75 percent uh, reimbursement for our costs related to the damage from, from, the certain, state. from the state. And potentially the state may get some federal money, but we we think 75% is going to be where we are. So 25% would be our share. So I, I don't know what the number is going to be, but you know, it's it's um, we'll be on the hook for 25%. For That's why it's important for us to get that, um, that level one uh, rating done so we can uh, qualify uh, for that. And you know this this is a perfect exercise in why having a healthy fund balance is so important. Um, if this would have been a very isolated incident, but you know still been you know, a couple of million dollars of damage, that would be probably all on us. So this this is one of the reasons why we always preach a healthy fund balance. You know, and now we're on the on the verge of hurricane season, and then we'll have ice storms in the winter. You know, so it's always there's always something working out there that we need to have the financial resources to be prepared for. What, what is our fund balance now? It's a uh, 11.6 million in the general fund. When it's, and that's about 25 percent of the uh, of the operating budget in the general fund, which is your goal. We we still have some reserve funds for fuel and some other. Yes. Things. Yeah. There are there are a few other pots of money, but that's that's the that's the big one. Main one. Is there a big change on the way the sales tax is going to be collected, and redistributed, or? I think there was some talk about it. I don't know. No, I think all that's going to be pretty much as is, yes, well. with the exception of the utility franchise tax or you, you, of the utilities. Your natural gas, your power, uh, being taxed on a sales tax basis versus a, a franchise tax. So we'll be subject to the seven percent tax, like everything else. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any appointments? I have an appointment for Lisa Marcus to the Community Appearance Commission. And I'd like to appoint uh, me and Stafford, McComb Stafford, to the Historic Preservation. I'd like to appoint Todd Hefner to the Public Art Commission. Any others? I move we approve the appointments. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Motion is unanimous. It's passed unanimously. Any any uh, petitions, requests, matters not on the agenda? General comments? I wanted to bring up um, last week the planning department put on a Brownfields program, and it was um, very interesting. It went through the history of what, what Brownfields are and the fact that we're on our, another round of uh, grant money that um, helps revitalize areas and they just I think it's just one of the best programs that we've been involved in and we've seen the success of it with the holler crossing and there's other places to be coming. 
Mr. Mayor, I'd like to recognize uh, Thomas McBrayer. You want to stand up for a second? He's a uh, junior, right, at uh, Hickory High, and he must have done something to really upset his father because he is doing an internship for two weeks with the city. <laughs> so uh, we'll see if his uh, mowing skills improve after this or how that works. <laughs> Thanks, Thomas. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. We're adjourned. Thank you for being here. Yeah, they used to make a I'm not going to call the screen. <laughs> <laughs>